So my brother will talk about some of these things. Um, in fact, we'll come, come back out here and maybe go through some of these other areas. But for now, uh, we'll just kind of start in this one room over here. So just uh, to kind of sort of orient to this room, you know, it's there's a lot of, uh, you know, more reading material and things more personal to him. But then there's also a lot of, uh, you know, merchandising things that that were brought um, by collectors. So uh, kind of starting here, you know, Steve Ditko is known for primarily, you know, Spider-Man and Doctor Strange, but he was so much more than that. So this was just a, brought a cross section of comics uh, and things that he had worked on, just so that people could see kind of the, the range of what he did. That, the, his, his Spider-Man and Doctor Strange era was really just, you know, a few years of, uh, of his 70 year career in, in doing comics. So this, this kind of gives more of the full range of things, you know, that he's done, <clears throat> you know, from, you know, working on, you know, uh, the Hulk, uh, to, you know, uh, Get Smart and Hogan's Heroes and, you know, Chuck Norris. I mean, he did a lot of things. He get, got into some of his more personal philosophical stuff, uh, Avenging World and, you know, Mr. A. So uh, kind of going back over to this side over here, <clears throat> that we have um, just a, a, a partial checklist of things that he did and it's you know 60 pages of of things that he actually worked on um, the one thing that he was really known for at least by some people is writing letters uh, he loved the correspondence in writing you know as a, a sort of old school person you know born in 27 uh, what the way he corresponded with people is is writing to them it was writing letters. He wasn't texting anybody or, you know, doing emails. He was writing letters. So if you wrote him a letter, <clears throat> he would write you back, you know, probably within that week. I mean, he definitely had a, a you know, pretty, probably pretty well structured time. He worked during the day and he did correspondence and read and studied. This is a, <clears throat> this is a, a, a fraction here of his library uh, that he had in his studio. There's also, you know, we'll kind of circle around here. There's another piece over here and a, and a, a much larger piece there, just to kind of give an idea of the things that he was uh, reading and studying. And, you know, I, I could say reading, but it wasn't just reading, he was studying it. The things that he did, just even for his job, were, you know, he did research on those things. So he's studying, you know, the, the criminal personality because he's writing things about crime. So he would really, you know, get, he would really dig deep into kind of the, you know, get into the head of the criminal so that when he's writing something, it's, it's more realistic. Now, of course, this is, you know, where the Spider-Man started, you know, he originally did a cover, which is out there, and then Stan just for some reason didn't like it. The, the word is it was too heroic or so, or not heroic enough or something. So he had Jack Kirby do a cover, pencil it, and then Steve Ditko inked it. Um, so this is actually the first appearance of Spider-Man. But, and then obviously some characters that he worked on, you know, Doctor Strange, Squirrel Girl, you know, Mysterio, Spider-Man, you know, of course the merchandising stuff just is, just goes through the roof. Now, what we have here is a, a series of, uh, of writings that he did. So when he left Marvel in 1966, he took some notes about what had occurred in that era. And um, he just kept them for personal notes. Then in the 90s, Stan started to uh, I, I guess there was you know, some Stan, Stan did some triggers where it actually, you know, made him formalize his notes. And um, he talks about them in his writings about what those things were. But Stan talked about a certain sequence that's actually out there on one of the back walls 
uh, in uh, Amazing Spider-Man 33, and he said, oh, I gave Steve that idea, and boy, he turned it into something fabulous. Uh, at that point, they weren't even talking. So they had stopped talking, you know, 10 issues prior to that. Stan had no idea what he was actually getting until he got the, pretty much the finished artwork and then a, a piece of paper that had the, pretty much the story and the script on it that then he kind of filled in, you know, the bubbles. So <clears throat> what he did is in 2001, he ended up um, taking those notes from 66 and then writing these 16 essays on what actually happened in the whole Spider-Man era. And these things really, well, how do I say it? I mean, they, they really paint the picture of what his role really was. And he wrote uh, an essay on Amazing Fantasy 15, which was the first appearance of Spider-Man, uh, Amazing Spider-Man 1, number 2, issue 3, and Green Goblin, and all these things where he kind of talks about how Stan and him would develop sort of the next story. And these things, the, the takeaway on these essays, and hopefully we'll get these, you know, published someday, get them sort of a, a, a people have a broader understanding of what actually occurred there. Um, because Stan, Stan, I'll say Stan was not really the storyteller in the, or the early Spider-Man era, the first three years, there's 38 issues. It was really Steve Ditko. Steve Ditko was the one that really laid out, you know, not only all the visual parts of the characters, you know, he was given the idea of, you know, okay, Spider-Man, he's a teenager, um, but what does he really look like? Stan didn't have that formulated. Um, he gave it to Jack Kirby first, but he didn't like Jack Kirby's. So he threw that away pretty much and said, Steve, you know, you create something. And then um, he had something like a character. He would give him a character, say, oh, the Green Goblin. Didn't give him any visuals. He just had a name. He might have just come up with a name. So this, these essays really kind of paint the picture of that, that Steve Ditko was really the primary storyteller. And it was halfway through uh, the series that he, when he did it, he, he said, uh, you know, I want plotting credit. I want writing credit. I'm the, one, I'm the one writing and plotting this stuff. So eventually he got that credit, but it didn't happen till you know, partway through. And I, you know, I'll, I'll just throw in my own thing. There had to be some friction you know, going on because Stan and my uncle were talking about what was what he wanted to do in the next issue. And sometimes my uncle would say, if you want to do that, get another artist because I won't do that. So uh, I have to believe that that caused some friction. And then at one point, Stan even publicly said, you know, oh, Steve Ditko, he thinks he's the genius of the world. You know, well, why would you start to like dig like that, you know? So anyway, these essays, I kind of scattered uh, little excerpts from these 16 essays all around, you know, kind of here, just to give people a little bit deeper insight until we could get sort of a broader, you know, published essays around. And then again, these are just, you know, more comics, you know, that he, that he worked on, just to kind of show the range of those. Then he kind of stepped into a little different era you know, the Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, which Doctor Strange was his baby, you know, he came to Stan with that. That was all, that was all my uncle. So outside of that era, and, and I, I kind of use, you know, my own terminology or my own way to describe it, that kind of, <clears throat> that kind of work was, is very, I'll say cartoony, you know. Uh, but then when you get into some of the, the creepy and eerie, the Warren uh, art, this stuff is, is something so different, you know, artistically. And, and I always kind of emphasize this, and these were, these were my uncles. He, you know, through the 90s, he, he sent me a lot of his file copies of stuff. But you start looking at some of this Warren work, and you, you see a style that is so unlike this earlier, just to kind of show that he really had such a range of artistic ability. And, and it's not just artistic ability, it's the ability to tell a story and use that. So he definitely had some serious artistic chops. Um, kind of moving over here, you know, 
I just found this in some of the stuff he gave me. You know, it was just a bunch of, you know, Batmans from one and then three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. They were just the tops of the Batman comics. Um, I'm not sure what year these were published in. Arlen, do you know? I could probably figure it out. Yeah, I mean, early though, early stuff. So, uh, but anyway, he just had these. He had, he had his own collection of things. Um, I, I kind of want to jump over to here and then sort of jump back to tie something in. So as a kid, me personally, I mean, there were, there were comics all around the house. Um, the one that, I, that, I, that for me that was most memorable was Conga. So I, I read uh, Congo, you know, when I was four or five uh, in the early 60s, I was really interested in Conga. I liked him as a kid. He's sort of a, you know, a, a childish m monkey that's really big and gets into all these kind of adventures and stuff. And as a kid, I was really fascinated by this and it really st started a, a love of gorillas. So my uncle, uh, we were, we were probably at a uh, Christmas or some holiday or some time when he was there and he was showing my brother how to draw something. And I thought, oh my gosh, so Uncle Steve could draw. We, we had no idea that he was doing this stuff. These were around the house so we didn't connect up that he was my uncle's because sort of the adults were all told, look, when Uncle Steve comes in, you don't talk about comics. So the kids, we didn't know. It was just my Uncle Steve. So um, I, I saw that he was drawing and I said, Uncle Steve, can you draw me a gorilla? And boy, he just whips out this gorilla. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's an awesome gorilla. And not knowing that he was drawing the gorillas of the comics that I was reading. So every time I would see him, I'd go, hey, Uncle Steve, draw me a gorilla just as a little kid. And of course he would, because I'm a little kid, you know, and his uncle, he was my godfather too. So then I told him that story in 1991. So he drew me this, this gorilla and sent me this and said, you know, hey Mark, you're still monkeying around. Um, this is actually a picture of, of me and my brother Steve and Uncle Steve at where he grew up in his house. And uh, right around the probably 60, 62, 63, uh, era when he was doing uh, Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. And of course he was doing other stuff at the same time too. So uh, that's kind of kind of a cool little piece that sort of to, for me really ties it back to what actually where I first started to love his art. Not knowing that it was actually him at all. Now uh, this is just a piece that I have uh, that from Bill Sakenovich, a uh, famous artist, does a lot of different types of styles. Um, Big Ditko fan, as a lot of artists, you know, in the business are Ditko fans. They have some connection there. Uh, so this is just a just a nice uh, memory piece that he put together when my uncle passed away in uh, 2018. Uh, this is a this is a, a remembrance card uh, from that my dad put together. Um, my dad being his brother. So my dad actually put this together in kind of in memory of my uncle. So he had, he did that, he drew that up. Uh, this is just some other material, you know, that he had, uh, it's like a, kind of part of his library. Uh, this was clothes that he wore. This was his jacket that he walked around New York in uh, and really was, wore that out. I mean, this is the way, uh, probably in the harsh New York weather, this was the thing that kind of protected him. But then he would also wear these shirts. I mean, these were shirts that, there's pictures out there of him wearing these shirts when he was, you know, visiting back here in Johnstown. He was, I uh, wouldn't say flamboyant, but boy, he didn't have a hesitation on wearing something loud, you know. Uh, yeah, this is another part of his library. Uh, and uh, then uh, we do have these uh, reading tables that we put together so that uh, if anybody wanted to just actually get some hands on and kind of look through some stuff without trying to, you know, get into comics or something, but this is a, uh, there's a little selection. The one thing about, you know, the, a lot of the older art this day, these days is they, they do some, a really good job on creating these uh, compilation books. I mean, there is, Almost anything that you could want is out there. And as a reading copy, it's great. And uh, the coloring sometimes has some, you know, things to be desired, but generally it's pretty good 
you know, pretty good stuff. I mean, this, this one with his creepy uh, work, his Warren work, I mean, black and white, it looks fantastic. So uh, this reading table uh, is, you know, is definitely a, uh, a highlight here, the people being able to kind of look through it and, and really see uh, sort of firsthand if, if they didn't have the comics. And even people who had the comics, they love these larger editions. You know, uh, a guy came in earlier and said, wow, this is the size I need to read because it's so easy to read. <laughs> so I think that is about everything in this room. Oh, this, this stuff on his desk, um, or this desk, uh, it wasn't necessarily his desk, but uh, this is all stuff that he had sent me over time except for his, this is his radio. Uh, he had this in his, uh, in his studio, and then these drafting tools, he used to use these, these were his. Uh, these tapes, tapes were his, again, part of his library. You know, the Declaration of Independence, and you know, it just kind of gives you that range of, you know, what was he actually into, uh, and, and really studying. I mean, who has a, a cassette tape of the Declaration of Independence? You know, just kind of show you the, the range that he was really interested in. Um, and then these are just, just uh, some sketches that he did. And I think that is about it in this room. Now what? <laughs> are there things out there you want to show? Uh, uh, yeah, I could probably head out that way and show you a few other things. OK. OK. Good. OK. You leave and don't follow. OK. Um, you know what, let's, uh, let's go to the beginning here. <clears throat> that camera looks heavy. <laughs> okay, should I just keep going? Sure. Okay. All right, so, um, so th this, this exhibit really wasn't supposed to be about or wasn't focusing on original art. So we have a sort of a, a small amount of original art other than some of the things that are in that other room or here that people weren't aware of that he did or had never seen it. But, you know, these pages of original art, someone, you know, who was a collector said, you know, go ahead and we could put those down here. Uh, so we needed to have some, some sort of original art. Now, this, um, this is all stuff that, um, that my uncle had at, at one point uh, sent to my dad. So uh, a few years prior to him passing away, I can't remember obviously the, the timing, it might have been five years, four years, three years, something, but prior to him passing away, he was sending my dad things that he just had. Uh, I guess he was just, you know, passing it on. You know, my dad is the, the, the child of the family. There were four kids, he was the baby of the family. So he, he was sort of a, kind of a, uh, a caretaker of all of the family type things. So my uncle was sending him stuff. So he, there were some, some blocks that he, carving blocks, just like stamp blocks that he created when he was, uh, I think in high school. Um, this, there's a bunch of photos here and a little sketch there, a little kind of a print of a sketch of things that he drew when he was in the military. So this is mostly his military stuff. That was his camera and um, there's, this, uh, this album, he had created this album, I guess, when he was in the military because he had a camera and he was taking pictures of things constantly. So he, there's, I mean, his dog tags in there. So all this military memorabilia, he had mounted these photos and then written down these, on these little cards what each photo was. So there's a, a whole book of them. We just have one page of them open. You know, at some point maybe we're, you know, publishing that. Uh, you know, in a bigger volume. Uh, and then when, when he passed away, when we went to his studio and his, um, his apartment to clean it out, these were his pens and then his, uh, his pen set. So this is stuff that, uh, that the estate obviously owns right now. And then over here uh, in this case is uh, kind of all locked in there tight, uh, his, um, uh, uh, the yearbook for the year that he graduated Johnson High, which, uh, you know, it's kind of locked in there because they go, everybody knows, you know, Ditko in 45, that yearbook, uh, if you could pick it up for under a thousand bucks, you're doing good. 
So <clears throat> that one is treasured by some people. Uh, and then this Spider-Man poster, uh, these, are, these are very rare, you know. Uh, I've never seen one. This is from a collector here in Johnstown. Uh, and I, I don't really know the history of these, if these were mailed out or how, how people got them in their hands. I mean, were they mailed out, Arlen? I think they were. They had them rolled up in a tube. Yeah, because how else could they have delivered them back in the day? I have seen. I saw one. I thought that had folds in it, really? but yeah, and I thought because uh, the owner of this, I think he had one prior, but I thought I seem to remember creases in it. But this one's in, I would say, in great condition for the fact how, how old it is. Yeah, that's a that's a collector's item. I don't know what that's worth, but that's worth something. Um, <clears throat> these were just um, printouts of some of the covers from Spider-Man. And I guess jumping over here, go this way. Um, this will kind of start here. This is just some covers. Now this one, the way this kind of sort of wrapped around here is this is uh, Steve Ditko's version of Amazing Fantasy 15. So that was the first appearance of Spider-Man, but it wasn't the one that actually made the cover. The one that made the cover was the one that's actually shown in there that Jack Kirby ended up redrawing. So this is the one that Steve Ditko did that was never published, and I think they use it in a later, some much later issue, just to kind of as an ode to you know Steve Ditko. Uh, Spider-Man number one, uh, I think uh, drawn by, penciled by Jack Kirby, and then inked by Steve Ditko. And then, you know, I guess in the whole production process, you know, they're, they, they have, you know, they have the original art and at some point they have to produce a comic. So they have the, these are um, uh, production art. So I guess it's on, it's in the chain. I'm not necessarily an expert in the, you know, how comics were created in different eras, uh, but these are just some, uh, I guess, like photostats, I guess you'd call them. Um, to, that they would actually use to get real crisp printing uh, of the comics. And then I, I'm not really sure at what point do they get colorized, but those photo stats, uh, you know, I see them pop up every now and then. Uh, these are really nice, nice quality ones. Uh, sometimes you, there's knockoffs, um, but these are really nice. Uh, Doctor Strange uh, pinup. Uh, and of course, Doctor Strange, you know, you go back to the, you know, the Spider-Man Marvel era, Doctor Strange was really, it was really his baby. He, he did the, laid out the first issue. He came to Stan and said, hey, I have this new character, you know, I think we should give it a try. And Stan, uh, Stan being Stan was like, okay, so, you know, he even said, you know, to Steve's idea, I don't know if it's any good, we'll give it a shot. Just kind of distancing himself from it, just not sure how the, the, you know, the readers would react to it. But of course, now we know that Doctor Strange was a success. <clears throat> uh, and then um, these are kind of scattered around. They're just sort of color guides um, used for this one, probably for the final printing. And let's kind of move over here. So th this, this center area is really more of the family stuff which was really, when this event was really put together, there was, a, there was an intention and a thought that it would coincide with the uh, Steve Ditko f uh, friends and family book that we were putting together. Uh, but production, you know, uh, got a little delayed on that and we didn't have it. So there's still a lot of family stuff here uh, that we have just, that. Eventually, probably we'll get into the, the book. Um, I am going to let my brother talk about some of this stuff. So I'm going to peel around here. And so this, this here is uh, pretty much a, a, you know, a wall of artwork that I was, that I was given by uh, a pretty famous artist that I became friends with um, around 1990. And he, uh, I won't name his name, um, but 
he was uh, told me at different times he was dropping work off at uh, Marvel and he saw stacks of original art <laughs> that happened to be Spider-Man number five. And he said he just could not resist. He was a big Ditko fan. And um, so in the 60s, he said he just threw it on the copier and made some copies. So this is uh, Spider Amazing Spider-Man 5, uh, 38. And then uh, this is uh, Chuck Norris uh, pencils that he did. And then uh, this unpublished alien story. But anyway, I made friends with this uh, artist and at, over seeing him after from comic convention to comic convention, eventually he said, you know, Mark, I have some stuff I have to give you. And he ended up just mailing me a big envelope with all these 11 by 17 copies that he had give, that he had. And I ended up getting them, you know, scanned and, you know, healed together and kind of cleaned up. Um, so in this one in particular, Spider-Man 5, uh, I have a friend who, um, yeah, he prides himself in knowing where every page of Spider-Man is in the original art. And um, there's some that are lost, some that no one really knows where it is, and some are kind of deep hidden down in collector's vaults. But he called me up before I came here, and he said, hey, Mark, um, I heard from a friend that there was some display somewhere in Pennsylvania that had Amazing uh, Spider-Man 5, the, the pens, the inks of Amazing Spider-Man 5. He goes, you know anything about that? I was like, yeah, that's where I'm going. I was leaving in, the, you know, in a couple days. I said, yeah, that's our Ditko exhibit that we're putting together because he, again, he prides himself in knowing where all the art is. And he said, you know, five is lost. No one knows where the, the inks are and in the original art for number five. So this is something that, you know, if you want to see this, is really doesn't exist anywhere. And it only exists because of my friend who in the 60s saw it in Marvel and made a copy of it. Um, and then, you know, to me, looking at these pencils is really kind of interesting that you look at and what it takes to actually put artwork together, not, and not as, a, not as an artist, you're not drawing a vase with flowers on it. You're actually doing, you know, what they call sequential art. And uh, my uncle, he was really big about giving artists advice. So at some point I like to collect that advice, but one of the things he said to do, which to me just blows my mind. I mean, I grew up, all, all of my family grew up drawing. We were always doing stuff. I don't do that now, but as a kid, we all drew. But my uncle said to, to really get yourself sort of dialed into doing like comic art or sequential art, he said, what you need to do is you need to have a, have a room, imagine a space, imagine a scene in the room, and then draw it from all different perspectives from around the room. So it's the exact same scene, but you want to draw it from all different perspectives. Uh, I'm sorry, I just go like, what? Like, because you, you have a scene where you're, somebody's doing something and there's a door and, and a knock, knock, knock on the door and it's drawn from this perspective. The next thing you know, the next panel has to be the door facing this way and looking at that person. So you have to be able to just look at that and have that almost three-dimensional perspective so that you could literally draw it from every angle. Beyond that, he says, you better know anatomy and how clothing drapes and musculature and all that. So it's, to me, this artwork is, is, is a, an amazing, ha to, to have a, that talent to do that and have all those pieces of the puzzle together. So this, these pencils are kind of interesting because you start to look at, well, he's just sort of sto he's storyboarding it out in a way and he's doing that just in, in pencil and doing it sort of panel by panel, page by page, and just plotting it, you know, to a certain degree in his head and, and head, you know, from mind to pen or pencil. Uh, just 
phenomenal skill, you know. Uh, this, this story here, this alien story, it's an unpublished alien story, and the only thing that really exists are these pencils. No one that I've ever run into knows where it, it, this came from, what it was for, or anything. So that's this, again, to just, to me, an illustration of just w sort of penciling things. Um, when you really start talking about Steve Ditko, you, you kind of look at what his influences are. And yes, he, you know, was the artist behind Spider-Man. He did a lot, all responsible for all the visuals. Uh, at some point, you could say he took over all the plotting of the stories, but you could probably say he did a lot, most of the character development throughout the whole run. But other things where this is Jack Kirby's Iron Man, and, and it's really, if you saw the, the original Iron Man movie, the Iron Man that he built in the cave, that was Jack Kirby's Iron Man. But when Steve Ditko got a hold of it, he created basically the definitive Iron Man suit. So this is these, these things where he had kind of an influence and an impact in, the, in the laying the groundwork for the Marvel Universe. This, you know, some people would argue uh, and say that it's probably the the most impacting, you know, sequential art. You know, uh, obviously there's countless, uh, you know, artifacts out there in terms of artwork. But this is something that, again, he this at this point in Amazing Spider-Man 33, he was doing all this. He was plotting all this. This was all coming directly from his head to paper. There was no other outside influences. But this lifting scene where Spider-Man is caught under all this machinery and then how he developed these, you know, the, the strain and showing the struggle and the floating heads and, you know, the thoughts going through and then the panels getting bigger and bigger as he, you know, starts to gain strength and little by little by little until he ends up just sort of overcoming this. And I, I they, they did an attempt at that in the last movie, which, eh, you know, <laughs> it was okay. I mean, they were obviously taking this and trying to put it in film, but I have to say, this artwork, to me, is far better than what they did in the movie. And the movie with billion dollar budgets and all that animation and CGI and stuff, I don't think they actually did the justice <laughs> to what he did in the 60s with pen and pencil. So. Obviously, that's a classic. Uh, he, some other Spider-Man stuff, and of course, he's doing the villains. You know, uh, Mysterio and Electro. I mean, he's he's creating all those villains. He's creating the visuals. He's adding them into the storyline. You know, uh, he wasn't just an artist. You know, and that's the one thing we're trying to get here. You know, people to understand it. He wasn't just an artist. Uh, <laughs> You know, okay, so journey into mystery and you get into all his other stuff that he did, you know, from Marvel. This, the volume is almost unfathomable, the amount of work that he did. I mean, he drew for 70 years and he produced volumes like just amazing amount of, of work. Uh, I, I have, he, he sent me through the 90s a lot of his most of his file copies of this. I have a couple long boxes with those pages just packed, boarded in there so tight that I can't even slide another one in. And one day I kind of took those out and I just started to look through them. And the artistic level of what he was doing that even through the 50s and early 60s, just phenomenal. When he left, uh, when he left Marvel, uh, he went over, and he was always working with Charlton, but then it comes to the Blue Beetle. And, you know, a lot of people see Blue Beetle as just sort of an extension of Spider-Man. You look at the movement of the Blue Beetle, you look at the comics of Blue Beetle, and you see Spider-Man. In fact, there's an artist who does recreations, and he takes the Spider-Man covers, and he puts a Blue Beetle in there. It's just really interesting little play on that, on the whole era of Blue Beetle. To me, it was like, uh, you know, and other people have said, you know, it's, it's Peter, where Peter Parker would have gone, you know, into this, into the sort of the Blue Beetle thing. Uh, in issue 400, I think they, uh, you know, selected a bunch of sort of prominent artists uh, to do their version of Superman. So this was his. Uh, and 
you know, it, to me, as a, just as an illustration of what, uh, how he saw a hero is really what he's showing here, you know? It's just he looked at uh, Superman as, you know, his, his version of that is, is a hero, somebody who you look up to, somebody who you, you know, admire and strive to be. Uh, he worked at DC, did, you know, Hawk and Dove, um, he, again, the house of mystery, this stuff, I mean, some of this, I mean, this is his creativity. You know, in the 60s, there was a, a you know, sort of the hippie movement thought, oh, you know, he must be on drugs. I mean, because how does a normal person come up with this kind of thing? But he wasn't. I mean, he was straight-laced, but he still had one heck of imagination, and that's really what it was. Creeper uh, also did a DC live uh, personal fan of the creeper, love the imagery. Um, he and I kind of talked about, uh, we wrote a little bit back and forth about, uh, about the creeper. 